Thanks, Darren. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Darren. We're super excited to be here with you today for the digital program. My name is Leanne Presley, and I'm here with my colleague, Laura Cameron. And we wanted to take some time today to just review from a marketer's perspective what we saw at the show. A couple do's, a couple don'ts. Uh, we will be open to running this workshop style. So if you've got a question, you can go ahead and put that in chat. And I'll poke in there periodically to check for comments. Uh, or I guess, Laura, we can just let them uh, interrupt us with a, if they want to come on audio or video. We're totally casual here. And uh, we've prepared a couple slides for you. We took a lot of photos at the show and we're all visual people. So I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I like to see things. So we prepared a deck for you and we'll go through that today. So welcome, everybody. Sure. Welcome. Uh, so, go ahead, Laura, you want to do the first one? <clears throat> oh, I can. So um, we just wanted to tell you a little bit about Stitch Rap Marketing. We are a uh, boutique marketing agency and we work exclusively with clients in the fiber and fabric space. So soft craft industries. We have clients who are yarn dyers and manufacturers. Um, we have had local quilt stores, local yarn stores, needle manufacturers, wool wash, um, you know, sort of anything you can think of that complements the industry that makes up our client base. Um, we primarily specialize in strategy and execution of social media. That's where we focus most of our time. I also include their newsletters, blogs, creating content for your website and um, your various online social media presences. Um, we focus on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Pinterest, but we are open to others. Um, we also work with a, a robust network of subcontractors, and so we have the ability to provide you with some website design and maintenance, um, some branding, logo design, digital ad placement, um, and we are starting some new mastermind groups in August. We have some information about this later on. So if you have marketing questions, we are available. You can find us at stitchcraftmarketing.com. We publish twice monthly blog posts. We have um, a newsletter that goes out once a month, and then we also conduct what we call office hours, where we present um, just a few minutes on a Zoom call on a topic, um, and then you can ask us questions either on that topic or on anything. It's a space for you to get a little bit of free marketing advice. Um, we are all crafters, um, and we have been working in the crafting world for quite a while, so we sort of speak the language. We know who your customers are, and um, we're thrilled to help you build sustaining, uh, uh, sustainable, thriving businesses. So that's just a little bit about who we are and sort of um, how we got tapped to do this presentation. So um, we broke the presentation down kind of into some best practices and some tips for exhibitors and retailers um, based on what we saw throughout the conference. And we're gonna kind of just talk back and forth. Um, like Leanne said, we're super visual. So I've added uh, lots of our photos as well as things I found on social media, just so we can kind of illustrate the kinds of things we thought were interesting. So our tip number one is to everyone to share what you're doing. I know um, you, not everyone loves social media, um, but it is a great way to share either if you're an exhibitor, what you're doing, um, or as a retailer, um, what kinds of things you're seeing. Uh, if you look up the hashtag HH Americas, you can see all kinds of fun pictures from over the weekend um, from everyone from um, exhibitors to attendees. And then the other thing that I thought was kind of cool, and this is actually my local yarn shop, so I recognized it, was that my local yarn shop was there and then um, shared a photo afterwards about something she purchased that's gonna come this fall. And these are gorgeous Freya yarns. Um, and I'm super excited she's gonna be stocking them this fall, but this is kind of a way for you to share where you're going and who you're seeing and what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love, love, the, I love this bad. idea, Laura. I think um, we saw this all over the show. And one of the things I want to point out is in the left-hand image that you have here, the booth 530, June 22 to 24, is one of the exhibitors. And I love how that exhibitor really thought uh, was thoughtful about the post that they were going to post. Because as you'll see later in our presentation, that image comes up again and that consistency was just wonderful because that that is the same image that she had she or he had in the booth uh, and then that was another photo opportunity for people to come and and take a photo with that uh which you'll see i thought that yeah, was the watermelon really and the clever. pineapple and the coconut they, they the were pineapple and the coconut. Yeah, yeah and i guess the same can be said of the one right next to it the woman uh wearing the pink dress uh that'll be one of our tips too is 
just shout it loud and clear, not only in your booth, but uh, it, and on the social channels as much as you can, because people make that visual connection, right? They see it on Instagram and then they're like, oh, there's that beautiful dress I saw. Oh yeah, I'm going to go over and chat with her. Uh, so I, I think people should be on social and using the hashtags and or you know using this as an opportunity to promote their content and what they're seeing on their channels. Yeah. So our second tip, this is kind of for everyone, is to network. You have so many opportunities when you get there to meet people, whether you are using the app, which I've highlighted here on the left. Um, you can also, you could scan people's badges, which meant you could connect with people and you will still have an opportunity until the end of July to download that information from um, the h, h Connect app. So if you met up with people, it was super easy to exchange details. You didn't necessarily even have to exchange business cards. Um, and I have chatted with a few people since I got back. And then the other other thing that I really liked was the, um, this is the CIA booth, the Craft Industry Alliance. They had an area set up where everyone could take photos together. Um, and it was just, it was a fun time to meet up. It's been such a long time since we've been able to gather in person. And whether you're seeing old friends or making new ones, um, you know, really meeting anyone you can and, and putting connections together, you never know who you meet today will be someone who you can do business with tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have much to add here. I think that's really a great suggestion. And I always try to do that ahead of time. I think the only uh, thing I would that I would add or say is to maybe prep that a little bit, take some time to go through the program, visit the website, see what's happening. Uh, because I did hear at the show a couple of people that were disappointed that they missed such and such or so and so. Oh, I didn't know the designers were getting together or, oh, I didn't know there was a TNNA meeting. Uh, so if, if you want to take a few minutes before you get to the show and, you know, make a calendar or make a schedule of all the events and the meetups, because there's tons of things going on. Sometimes things are overlapping those networking events, uh, just so that you are, um, planning who you want to meet with and don't miss those opportunities. Yeah. So now we're going to move into our five tips for exhibitors. Um, and then after this, we'll go into our five tips for retailers. So if you're a retailer, um, you know, you, you may get something useful for exhibitors because a lot of this is about display and sort of how to, how to build your booth and how to introduce yourself to customers. And some of that will be relevant to you. And then we'll flip flop and do the second half. So I will let Leanne start on this one. Yeah. So the first tip one is to make the mo most of your booth space. Uh, we took a lot of video of different types of booths. And I will say, you know, there's a lot of different styles, a lot of different ways that you can plan out your booth. And as you can see in the video on the right, you know, this is the Indie Untangled space. Um, some of it was kind of crowded, to be honest. Uh, I know their spaces were small. And one of the things Laura and I talked about was, you know, maybe some exhibitors don't take time ahead of time, maybe to tape things out. When we've exhibited at shows before, that's one thing we do is we just take painter's tape and put it on the floor so that you can see how much space you actually do have. And maybe you leave those couple of pieces of furniture at home, uh, right? The whole idea is to get people into your space, uh, have them be comfortable so that you can talk sales with them. Uh, Northwoods Fibers was one on the left that we saw which we thought did a great job of having an inviting space where all the products were available. They were, you know, of course, colorfully arranged, but the working space in the actual booth was such that you could get in there, you could talk to people, you could move around. Yeah, I mean, I sort of felt the same way about um, the Wyndham Fabrics booth. They did have tables set up where you could sit down and do business, but there was kind of a way that people could flow through there so that mm -hmm. they can touch and see your products so they don't have to wait. We saw a couple booths with a piece of furniture like right up at the front of the booth. And if you had a narrow booth, that kind of um, limited who could get into your booth. Um, and, and it creates kind of a traffic jam and it's just not the best way to like welcome people into your booth, especially since our industry is so much based on color and texture and touching and feeling and you know you want to touch the fabrics you want to touch the yarns and um you know if if you can't get into sorry if, if you can't get in to see that um it becomes a little hard um the interesting part um that i want to say is let me just pause this video so it doesn't yeah. It's not going to go again. Um, one of the things that we talked about was, so I saw this booth on the left here as kind of um, welcoming and kind of fun. Like they had a comfortable place to sit. They had fun right. pillows. They had fun quilts. And yeah. when Leanne and I were talking about it, she was like, well, you know, but if people were in there sitting and talking and having a conversation, I would yeah. feel like I couldn't go in and look at those yeah. quilts closer. 
Yeah. And, and you feel like you're interrupting, you know, at a couple of times there was uh, people sitting on the couches and I, you know, most people wouldn't have known if they were the owners or they were customers. And this is maybe just me, but I felt like uh, I would be interrupting and the other booths where people were standing or they were at the top booths where there's like two chairs and I like a cafe table. I don't know. For me, I felt like that was a little bit more approachable. Um, so just something to think about, you know, different, different strokes for different folks. Uh, on the one hand, the couches are fantastic. It's inviting. It want, you want people to come in and sit down, but then what happens when they do, they come in, they sit down and they hang out a while. Then you've got other customers that may feel intimidated to interrupt that, what appears to be a social gathering. I don't know, just something you and I talked about that we thought we'd share with. Yeah, it was, uh, I just wanted to point out that we both had different reactions to it because, because I thought this was kind of fun and colorful and inviting, but, yeah. but I do see Leanne's point that if you are having a serious conversation in there, then people can't get in to see the rest of your stuff. Right. So just something to think about. Yeah. And I, and I will also add, I've done an exhibit and a trade show with the H and H organization with Darren specifically, who's on the call. And I would defer to them. They do a fantastic job sort of talking to you about positioning and where on the show floor would be best for you. Like this anthology is on the corner. So if you need a walkthrough, maybe he helps you find a corner, corner booth uh, and or coaches you through the different kinds of furniture packages that are available, what would or wouldn't work for your style. I know that for my particular situation, when we went to Cologne, we did more of a walkthrough style of booth and Darren did a great job coaching us through those different options. So defer to the experts on that if you're really not sure which style of booth would work best for your business. Okay, our second tip is to wear or demo your product. Um, one of the things that I absolutely loved about the Circulo booth is um, now they're a Brazilian co yarn company. Um, every day they were wearing crochet or knit garments. Um, and I just thought that was super fun. And they had all these mannequins with great dresses on them. I saw mannequins in other booths. I also saw other people wearing their wares. Um, but just if you're trying to convince people to purchase your products and turn them into things that they will wear, the best way to do it is to wear them. I also saw a lot of folks, if you have products that are not wearable, just being able to demo them. We went into... Um, the June Taylor booth and yeah. June Taylor makes all kinds of June Taylor is a um, sewing product and um, merchandise company and they don't actually sell fabric, but they have all these great solutions They had kind of a sew by numbers kit. Um, and she was able to just walk us through the entire demonstration of how that thing worked mm -hmm. and it you know, it was much better than just having like a prepackaged product sitting on the front of the booth because we actually got to see she um, had projects in various states showing us how you worked through them and how all the tools work together. And that was really, really cool. So I would definitely say wear or demo your product. Um, you know, you kind of have to be an evangelist at these shows. You, you have to tell everyone why it's so great. Yeah, and it's a wonderful opportunity to open up a conversation about your product. Uh, many, many uh, vendors were wearing shawls or wraps or tops or like this particular example where she's got this gorgeous uh, pink dress on. And you immediately as knitters or as fiber people or soft crafts people were like, oh my gosh, I love that dress. And then her response was, oh yes, it's made out of so-and-so and this is how it's constructed. And you know, the next sales step is come on in the booth and let me show you that yarn. And so it just naturally lends itself to a sales conversation that doesn't feel overly pushy. Okay, I'll let you start with this one if you'd like. Yeah, tip number three, give folks a bit of fun and a photo op. Uh, I, you know, think about how your display in your booth brings out your personality. Uh, for example, we saw, you know, with Wyndham and Anthology, just bright, colorful, uh, the butterfly, so many people jumped in front of this image. Uh, and then, of course, that is fodder and content for all the social channels when you're applying the hashtags and you're out there posting about it. People just want to share what beautiful uh, fabrics and, and displays they saw. The one on, on the uh, right, the Virhees textiles, yes, that is me sticking my head. I mean, that's not the kind of thing I do normally, but when you're there, I just, I couldn't resist to stick my head in there and have a fun photo and, you know, it turned out great. So if you're a vendor, try to think about opportunities where you can set up a display or a, an obvious photo op because that's just fun for your customers. And like I said, it's content for social channels, which uh, is great for extending your brand beyond the actual live event. 
Yeah, and these were just a few others that we liked. Like we said, um, Fabric Editions, uh, all of their branding is sort of around these fun little amigurumi creatures. They're actually a fabric company, but it's just super fun and kind of a mixing of the crafts. Um, and then I really loved um, Wonderland Yarns built this archway into their booth. And not only was it, you know, kind of a feast for the eyes, but it was like a perfect place to take a pho photograph. These are the owners of Wonderland Yarns. Um, but, but I saw tons of photos on social media of people in the archway. Um, so it's just, you know, it's something to make you a little bit more memorable, something for people to have fun with, let them share on social media. Um, and it just gets you, you and your products out there because of course people mm -hmm. are looking at these booths going, which booth is that? I want to know what they mm -hmm. sell, you know, and somebody could be looking at those gradient yarns thinking, I really need all of those in my shop, or I really and, need all of those in my stash. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Laura, I mean, the unfortunate truth about some of the booths that didn't take advantage of this and didn't do it. You know, you know, the ones that you walk by and they've got a big space and maybe they just had a couple table and chairs with a catalog on it or a notebook on it. And there wasn't a lot of inviting stuff. Unfortunately, those were the booths that didn't have a lot of traffic in them. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think if you do follow our advice and try to create something fun, something inviting, you will see a conversion in traffic. Tip number four, and this was kind of a big trend. I also saw this in the trends talk earlier this week with Prime Media, um, going green. Whether you are producing green products or whether um, you are actually putting your green products um, in green packaging. I thought um, there were a couple spots of this, but particularly with Ecotex, they had their organic bias tape and it's all um, kind of unrecycled cardboard packaging. And I thought that was really cool. And in um, a world that is sort of grappling with how we can be more eco-friendly and more sustainable. Um, I thought it was just really, it was, a, it was a nice touch. And I think, you know, if you're selling yarn, there are lots of things that you can, I mean, you can't change sort of um, the labeling. You can't, it, depending on, if you're a local yarn store, you can't necessarily change those things. If you're a company, you can, but you can also change the way you package things up. Or if you print some of your handouts on um, recycled paper, or if you hand out postcards that have QR codes on them so people can find the information digitally later, rather than bringing thick digital catalogs. Um, you know, there are things that you can do sort of in your booth to suggest that you are working towards a more eco and green sustainable future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's show the next slide. We have another example of sure. some more companies, the scan fill and the design works again, just reinforcing what we see as an overall trend in the industry is moving more towards green packaging, green products, and trying to be environmentally conscientious. Um, I guess the other thing I would say about this trend is I, I like seeing when there is flow through from a brand, a brand story, and what they're exhibiting. Uh, if your brand is all about color, make sure your booth is colorful. You know, I know it sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how many people fall down on that task. Uh, and in the case of if you have uh, an environmentally friend friendly company or standards as part of your brand story, make sure that's front and center and make sure there's flow through, make sure like we just saw in the previous one that you're, if you're organic, your packaging is organic or you know that, that you don't have that disconnect between the product you're selling and how you're presenting it to the world. Okay. Tip five is work that mailing list. Uh, again, I, I hate to come up with this uh, in, in um, as a reflection of what we see people doing wrong, but so many exhibitors just don't do this. And I think it's a really big missed opportunity. So when you're in your exhibit, uh, when you're in your uh, space, make sure that you are collecting information from every person that comes in your booth. And we put together a couple of tools here. There's tons of these card scanning apps. One of them is Evernote, which a lot of people just use in other parts of their organizational life. It makes it super easy to scan a business card and then dump that into a database that you can work later on. Uh, if you don't want to be that techie, you can just do old fashioned clipboard. You know, when people come in and you're having a discussion with them, uh, either exchange business cards or ask them to take a minute to fill out their email address. Uh, hey, can we stay in touch? and hand them your clipboard. And then of course you got to go home and enter all that data, which is why the card scanning apps are so fantastic. 
Um, and then, like Laura mentioned at the top of the presentation, you can utilize the app also. Uh, this particular app at, at this trade show had a wonderful QR code interactions and ways to collect information from people that you can then process later on. But don't miss the opportunity to connect with them at the show, get their email address, and then start to correspond with them after the show. That's what it's all about. It looks like we might, is there a question in chat? I can like see that it's lit up, but I don't have chat open because I have the, was uh, no. Oh no, that was Darren. Okay, never mind. Darren's well, asking oh. people if there are questions. <laughs> we'll go on to the next. Um, so now we're gonna shift focus a little bit and look at kind of from the retailer's perspective as you're visiting the show, um, what kinds of things you could see and take home and do. So this was kind of a big one, um, research the exhibitors before you arrive. And I will share that I do this for our company. So we're a social media company. Before this show, I go and look at um, the businesses that are gonna be exhibiting and I see which ones, um, I go and look at their social media presence. And if they um, are not doing everything I think they could be doing, I put them on our list so that I can go visit them and um, ask them you know, what they're doing for their social media services and if we could help. Um, that's obviously my very personal focus, but um, apply it to yourself. Make sure you know who's gonna be at the show and whose booths you don't wanna miss. Um, if you take a little time to just research what's going on there um, and you know who, who is in your industry, who you might wanna bring into your shop um, and make yourself a list. Unfortunately, the show time on the show floor is really limited. It was only two days and um, time gets eaten up really fast when you meet up with people, when you see old friends, when you're, um, you know, looking at products and waiting to get into a booth. And if you have 10 to 15 people that you want to be sure you don't miss, um, then knowing who's going to be there ahead of time really, really helps. And h, &H has this map. They also had a directory. So you can kind of flip through and see if there's anyone who you're already buying from. from. You'd like to put a, um, you know, a face and a name together or um, see if there's somebody who might have some products that you haven't seen before that you'd like to see. And I guess the thing I would add to that is just a couple more efficiency tips that I employ and Laura and I do together or for you to think about when you're at the show floor. When you make that list, you know, your hit list of all the people that you really want to stop and visit, put it in and put it in, uh, organ organize it according to the rows so that you're going down a row and then coming back a row. I also like to make note of, of the adjacent aisles because you'll see, and if you're at the show, you know this happens, you're going to booth 222 and the owner is already talking to somebody. So gosh, are you gonna stand there for 15 minutes and wait for them to be done with their conversation? No, you're gonna bop over to row 340, which you know using the map is adjacent because you've circled your hit list of the places you wanna go. So you bop over to 300, do that conversation with the owner that is free and not talking to anybody and then circle back to row 200. So that's kind of how we do it to stay in sort of a bullseye area of the show floor and move around in like a hub and spoke fashion so that you're covering all that ground. Um, the other thing I would say is think about the kind of visitor you are in the booth. So I know from experience that a lot of exhibitors that are trying to sell products to retailers, for example, those are the people that they're there to see first. And so sometimes they get a little anxious if designers, uh, marketing companies, you know, people that aren't there to buy product from them are consuming the peak hours of the show. So we try not to do a lot of our heavy sales calls uh, like the very first day of the show, the first few hours of the show, because that's the time they don't want to see us, right? So they're not going to give us their attention. So think about that with the hat on of who are you and what do you need from that booth? If you're a retailer and you're there to buy yarn and that's their purpose, then you do want to get there early in the show and early in the day, because that's when they're expecting you the most, right? Does that make, does that make sense? Um, mm -hmm. And then just other tips, you know, if you're making appointments, which we'll talk about in a minute here, um, you know, just allow enough time uh, in between for you to, you know, take a breather, write down your notes, stay organized, and, and so on. So that's just kind of our tips on, on how to work the show floor. Uh, and like Laura said, the research really helped a ton because we didn't have time to see all of the people that we wanted to talk to. So we needed to really make a priority list who was first who had the worst social media that we thought would need our services the most, 
those were the places we visited first. And then, you know, day two towards the end of the day, like right before we're ready to head off to airports, that's when we were like, well, let's, let's try this one or let's go visit old friends or just so that you don't run out of time. Yeah. So my second tip is register for the classes and attend talks. Um, there were so many events that I did not get to go to that I wanted to, um, but I have been trying to catch up this week. Um, there are so many classes about business skills and things you might like to bring to your community. Um, and there is such a wide variety of presenters. And um, I just, I really found it inspiring all the different things that you could see and do. And obviously there wasn't enough time for all of it, um, but, but looking at the schedule beforehand and trying and sort of cherry picking the top two or three things means that you can kind of plan your booth visits and your time on the show floor around other times when you want to attend talks. And I will say the sofa talks were right there on the exhibit floor. Um, so you didn't even have to leave the show floor to go attend that. And then um, classes were just adjacent to where the show floor was. So there really wasn't a ton of time lost in heading over to the classrooms to catch things. Yeah. So and I, I just brought a few examples of um, different different people and their talks. Um, and you know, there were themes of diversity and sustainability. There were um, business skills. There were all kinds of things um, that that people taught classes on, um, and so many that I would have loved to take. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe we need to uh, lobby Darren to make the show a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a conversation later. Um, Cause I felt the same way, you know, I wanted to be on the show floor, but there was just so much fantastic, interesting information happening in these presentations. It was really just top notch presenters and really good quality information. Yeah. Okay. So the next one uh, we alluded to, which is pre-scheduling appointments with vendors. Uh, I, again, I think that uh, it's really important from both sides of of the perspective from the vendor side and the visitor side uh, to be conscientious about this and to utilize your time the most efficiently that you can. So make appointments with vendors. Um, there was two ways to do this. Uh, we saw that you could uh, connect on the app probably about like a week before, and you could send out a request for a meeting with someone that was exhibiting on the show floor. So if those of you on the call took advantage of that, brava. Uh, otherwise, I think you can just kind of do it the old fashioned way, just send those people an email and say, I see you're going to be at the show, I want to take some time to, you know, visit with you and place an order and get those on your calendar, uh, because you don't want to do what I recommended before where you're just circling in the hub from aisle to aisle to aisle to aisle and then you never get in because those exhibitors are so busy taking orders from other people so if you've got a couple of exhibitors that you really need to visit with and you want to touch and feel those products up close. Uh, make appointments, pre-schedule them. Yeah, um, one caveat I will say is when I talked to Darren towards the beginning of the show, he said about 50% of the exhibitors were on the app. So don't just rely on the app, unfortunately, because not everyone is making use of it. Um, right. I kind of went with a two-pronged approach, which is two or three weeks before the show, I collected the emails of everyone I thought we should meet. And I sent them an email and introduced myself and said, we're going to be at the h, h show. Would you have time to meet? And then I kind of did a second follow-up um, with people who I didn't already have appointments with on the app. And I did get a few um, responses on the app, but not all of them responded. So I'm not sure that all of them were on the app. So I would say use both, um, you know, and um, again, it also depends on what kind of customer you are. If you are a retailer looking to stock their products, they are going to return your emails. Whereas, you know, if you're a designer or in our case, a marketing firm who's selling something, they may not be as keen to um, return, return the connection um, so, you know, just, just be sure that you're telling them kind of who you are and what your interest is so they can gauge if they want to take a meeting with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I will add just one more little tip that I learned the hard way from experience from many, many trade shows is don't forget about your time zones, people. Uh, you know, if you're emailing somebody a week before the show and you're like me and you're in mountain zone, mountain time zone, but then you wrote down that you want to go see somebody's talk at noon in Chicago uh, time, central time zone, 
don't get those things confused. So uh, either be mindful when you're making the, the appointment in your time zone. I know this seems like super obvious to most people, but it's tripped me up more than once. Uh, so I would just say, you know, be mindful of that and, and utilize Google and the time zone switching options that they have in the phone, in your phone to uh, make sure that doesn't trip you up. So tip four was arrange for some samples for pre-shipping so you can make samples prior to the product arriving. Um, this is, there are some vendors who, if you um, place orders at the show, they will give you some samples to take home, but just remember to ask them about that because um, particularly if you want to prepare um, either, let's say some block of the month or some quilt options for quilt alongs in the fall, or if you're gonna host a knit along or a crochet along, um, or you're gonna be stocking a new um, yarn or fabric in the store, if you have a little bit of it ahead of time, you can make something with it so you can show people projects worked in those yarns or fabrics. Yeah, and we always say, uh, you know, you when you're trying to get your branding message out or your marketing messages out, uh, I always joke that you're going to have to tell people that you're going to tell them, and then you have to tell them, and then you have to tell them that you told them. So in this pre-notification phase, if you've got samples or like, let's say you come home with a couple of, of skeins labeled, you can take a photo of that and say, this is, I'm telling you, this is going to be coming up soon in September when we receive the yarn. So you're taking care of that first phase of tell them that you're going to tell them uh, and having samples on hand or something you can photograph for content and get it out there on your social channels and your newsletter early is going to help build that excitement to bring customers in. And when that yarn lands in your shop, You've got people that have been salivating, excited about it, ready to go, ready to buy, and ready to knit the samples that you're already showing in your, in your shop. Yeah. So that is all that we have today. Um, we're open to questions. Um, I just put in a slide here with both of our contact information. If you have any questions um, or are interested in discussing anything further, you are welcome to reach out to either of us. Um, and uh, our inboxes are always open. And then I will let Leanne speak briefly about a new opportunity that we have coming up. Yeah. Uh, so the new opportunities are mastermind groups. If you are a retailer uh, in the soft craft space, fiber or fabric, we're going to have two groups. One is going to be focused on growing and scaling your business. The other one is specifically for Bernina retailers. We're gonna meet every week for about 60 minutes for 12 weeks. And this is really a support, education, accountability group. It's an opportunity for you to not only learn from uh, our team, and as, but also from your peers. So when you've got challenges and you're trying to operate your business completely by yourself, you know, we get it. We know you're frustrated by that. So think about joining our mastermind group so you can get all the support you need to grow your business. There's a link there if you're interested. I only have five slots per group. One of them only has, the grown scale only has one slot left uh, and Bernina uh, only has a couple, a couple left. So if you're interested in that, uh, let us know. Okay, it looks like we have um, a couple questions and comments. Darren noted that in 2023, they're planning three full days plus the preview night party. So there will be a little bit more time allowed um, for classes and the show floor. Um, and then Duke the Cat Foster um, <laughs> asked a question. It may be out of your scope, but do you have any advice to designers at trade shows regarding how to approach vendors, et cetera? Um, do you want to take that? Do you want me to take that? Sure, I can start and you can you can add okay. in. Um, sure. I would say, no, it's not out of scope. We work with designers all the time okay. on helping them to uh, craft their brand, their messaging, their marketing. I mean, you're selling something just like a retailer, just like any other person in the craft space. So I would say uh, if you're a designer, um, I would, my advice to you would be to remember that um, they're looking for you as much as you're looking for them. We talked to so many people at the show that asked us, do you know designers that would want to work with our yarn? So, you know, I alluded earlier that maybe you're not the first person they want to see in their booth because they're trying to sell yarn, but patterns sell uh, yarn. So they do need to talk to you. They do need to make arrangements with you. Uh, my advice to you would be to make sure you have all your ducks in a row, uh, have a really nice portfolio of things you can show them, of pieces that you've done before. Uh, the biggest complaint I get from clients that we work with are that they don't get a sense of trust and professionalism from the designer. They get a sense that sometimes people are just walking into their booth saying, I'm a designer, can I have five skeins of yarn? And they have no way to vet them on the spot. Uh, so when you walk into a booth and you show them that you are a professional and you have the 
the evidence to back that up, i.e. a notebook with your samples, or you can speak clearly about the kinds of designs you want to design for them, or you come into the booth already having researched that company, and you've got some design suggestions for them. You know, oh, I love your merino worsted, and here's what I would make with it, or, you know, you get the idea. Um, that gives them some assurance that you're not just some fly-by-night person looking for free yarn. So that would be my advice to you. Uh, and of course, follow up afterwards. That's really important. Get your contacts, make your introductions, and then uh, again, be professional by following up afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the biggest thing that we hear from our clients um, sometimes is, oh, this designer called, I send them some yarn and I never saw the design. I never saw the design. I never heard about it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I realized that the design process is not necessarily they give you the yarn this week and in two weeks you have a pattern. It, it takes longer than that. But, you know, um, if you're working with a yarn company, um, send them a few shots as you're designing your piece, like just to show them that it's a work in progress. Let them know that it's coming when um, you're getting close to publishing. Let them know that you're getting close to publishing because again, if you're designing something on a specific base, make sure they have some. Um, there may be some co-marketing opportunities. You know, They may be able to push it to their clients just as you push um, your new pattern to your customers and share that you worked with this yarn designers um, um, specific yarn, they may want to um, host a knit along or offer a coupon code or, you know, there, there are lots of opportunities. And the more you approach it as a professional relationship and communicate with them, you know, where you are in your process, when you expect to be done, what you expect to deliver, um, you know, for whatever they give you, the more you can make that clear up front, um, the more likely they are to be like, to to be interested in working with you and to be excited. And, and honestly, my only other advice is follow through. Don't disappear because you prove that you are a trustworthy person. If you have a really good collaboration with them once, they are a hundred times more likely to collaborate with you again. Yeah. Reliable professional designers are hard to find. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we hear from a lot of our clients. That's what we hear. Yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, I would say thank you so much for your time. And um, again, feel free to reach out to us. We are already looking forward to next year's show. Yeah, we are. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks so much, Darren. Share.